Hello everyone, and welcome to the second video about making a 1915 evening ensemble. Last month I detailed the process of making the underdress, and today I'm focusing on the main attraction, which is an open front dress made from orange china silk and decorated with hundreds of hand-sewn flowers, along with thousands of sequins and some glass beads to tie it all together. This is one of the more elaborate projects I've taken on recently, and it required learning and implementing some techniques I'm unfamiliar with but I enjoyed the process so much and I'm really excited to share it with you. The first step was cutting out the bodice from the base fabric, which is a medium weight cotton. For the pattern, I used an altered version of the pattern I drafted for the underdress. The main difference is the lower neckline and points that dip beyond the natural waistline. I kind of stole slash borrowed slash was inspired by this idea from an extant garment. I'll link an image of it along with all my main references in the description box down below. I also cut the pattern out from China silk, which will be used for the top layer of fabric. I'll be using this for the lining too, so I cut it out twice. I pinned one set of the pieces together, then set them aside and refocused on the base layer. I'm transferring the boning channel placement marked on my pattern onto the base layers of material. The base layer will, as the name implies, serve as a base that supports the bodice. I actually cut two of these layers and will be creating boning channels by stitching the layers together, which is what you see me doing here. Spoiler alert, this actually ended up making the bodice too thick. The points of the waistline wouldn't turn out properly, so I had to remake the bodice using a single thinner base layer with boning inserted into ribbon channels like I used on the underdress. This is still a valid method too, and it cushions the boning so it's less visible through the top layer of fabric, which is why I did this in the first place. It just didn't work for this particular design. After stitching the channels, I pinned the silk lining to the wrong side of the base layer pieces. I stitched all the layers together, but made sure to leave one edge free of stitching so I could get the boning in easily. I trimmed off any slippery bits of silk, then sewed the bust seams. These seams were ironed open, then I top stitched the seam allowance down to create more boning channels. These got ironed again, and I trimmed the seam allowance down. I filled all the channels with quarter inch wide plastic boning. I will link where I buy this down below. I think it's referred to as synthetic whalebone now, but it's the same boning that I've always used. The bones were cut to be an inch and a half shorter than each channel to allow for the seam allowances. Then I filed the corners with sandpaper so they won't wear down the fabric over time. That finishes off the base layer and lining, so now I could finally sew together the top layer of silk. I used a very tiny silk needle for this and fiddled with the tension a lot, but this was still a pain to sew. The whole you can't use a half loop stitch on china silk, it'll pucker thing is definitely accurate because everything makes it pucker. You can breathe too heavily in its direction and it will just shrivel up. It's kind of a disaster. <laughs> Just like with the lining, I ironed the seams and trimmed the allowance down. I lined the seams up and pinned the top layer of the bodice to the lining with the right sides facing each other. I'd intended to stitch across both the top and bottom edge, but I thought that would make it difficult to turn right side out with all the boning, so I just pinned and stitched across the bottom edge instead. I clipped off the points and clipped inward around the curves to help the edge turn outward smoothly. And then I turned the bodice the right way out. This is when I realized that my bodice wasn't going to work because the base layer was too thick and I couldn't turn the points out properly. They looked like chunky little nubs instead of the precise points I was hoping for. So I remade it with a thinner base layer and boning channels made from ribbon. I also stitched across the bottom edge by hand to secure it into position. And I stitched a half inch away from the top edge by machine to hold all the bones in place. I might have gotten ahead of myself and forgotten I was filming, but you didn't miss too much. Now I'm binding the top edge with lace tape to cover any frayed bits. I folded the top edge inward by a half inch, using the line of stitching I made earlier as a guide. To avoid visible stitching, this edge was secured down by hand with slip stitches. And these stitches are only going through the lining, so they're not visible from the top side of the fabric. 
Now it's time to start jazzing up a boring bodice. And I'm starting this process by adding lace to the neckline. This is the same lace I used on the underdress, and I'm using a ruler to make sure it's spaced an even inch away from the top edge. It was pinned on, then the top edge was secured by hand using a running stitch. I would have done this by machine, but the bodice has boning in it, and sewing over boning isn't my favorite thing, even when it's plastic. Even though this lace is pretty, it's just a base for the ribbon embroidery which will trim the neckline and skirt. And that is what makes this project really special. Ribbon embroidery is, like the name suggests, embroidery created out of tiny silk ribbons. This technique was commonly used on dresses from the 1920s and is probably one of the only things that I really like about 1920s fashion. It's incredibly delicate looking while having a lot of texture and is somehow both realistic and whimsical. I really, really enjoy how it looks and I was really excited to finally learn how to do it for this project. I mostly used two books, which I will link down below, to learn the basic stitches and designs used on this piece. Even though it was more intimidating, I liked the advanced book a lot more than the beginner-focused one. It explained concepts better and had more designs, but they were both really helpful. I also used some videos on Skillshare, who have kindly sponsored this video, to get an idea of the stitches in motion, and how it looks when someone who knows what they are doing is doing it. So for this very time-consuming process, I'm using squares of organza as a base. I picked this fabric since it's sturdy enough to use as a base for the appliques, but thin enough that the silks didn't seem to shred or tangle or become strained when they passed through it. I'm also using an 8-inch-ish embroidery hoop and some size 20 needles. But the showstopper are the silk ribbons. I ordered a variety of colors and widths from a whole bunch of different sellers, but I mostly use the 7mm wide ribbons in muted colors. As much as I enjoyed the embroidery process and the finished results, this project does have the downside of being pretty expensive. You're looking at about $150 worth of ribbon here, and though I didn't use all of this on the dress, I did use a fair chunk. So it's definitely something that you have to budget for before taking on something like this. Anyway, step one was setting up my hoop with the organza. Then embroidery could begin. The first flower design I followed involves a daisy chain stitch. So you go up through the fabric where you want the center of the flower to be, create a loop the length you want the petal to be, then go back down through the fabric right next to where you started. Bring the needle back up through the fabric just below the center of the loop you made. Make a small stitch to secure the loop, then repeat several times until you have a five or six petal thing that resembles a flower. The next flower design is even easier to do, but it's harder to explain because it's not really a technique that you'll see in traditional embroidery. All you do is start from the desired center of the flower and use your fingernail to position the ribbon over the fabric in a way you find pleasing. Then bring the needle through the end of the ribbon and pull it gently until it forms a petal shape. This is repeated another four or five times to form a flower. Then the ribbon can be tied off just like normal thread. Another design which creates fluffy flowers starts with the French knot at the center of the flower. Then make tiny, very loose stitches with the ribbon until it surrounds the center point. These can get gradually larger the further out from the center you get. I don't like this design as much since it looks a little bit messier and takes a whole lot more ribbon, but it does add a bit of texture which is nice. I repeated these three designs on both sides of the hoop, and I'm using each hoop's worth of embroidery to create two appliques, so I'm trying to create two separate clusters. I'm not good enough at this to make them perfectly symmetrical, so I didn't bother to try, but I did attempt to keep the density, color, and shape of the design similar on both sides. The other design I kind of know how to do is an iris, and this requires the daisy chain stitch used on the first flower. So you create one loop and stitch over it, then make another loop just below that and stitch over it to create a more dimensional petal. Then I did the normal daisy chain stitch three times below that, trying to make it look irisy. 
So those are actually all the flower patterns that I used on this project. There are a lot more elaborate ones out there, but I felt these suited my design and skill level the best. I made 22 hoops worth of embroidery in total, and each one took 30 to 40-ish minutes since I was still learning and struggling with tension. Tension on the ribbon, or lack thereof, is a big part of what makes the ribbon look like petals. If you pull the ribbon too tightly, the stitches lack volume and look like normal running stitches made from thick thread. I feel like that makes this much harder than traditional embroidery, and means general embroidery skills won't transfer over when working with ribbon. My other huge issue was with the ribbon twisting. This wasn't meant mentioned in any of the books, but the ribbon needs to be flat and smooth over the fabric, otherwise it doesn't have the width and texture required to look like petals. And do you know what ribbon does when you pull it through tightly woven fabric? It twists! <laughs> I found the lighter weight fabric helped prevent this somewhat, but you do have to be careful when pulling the ribbon through the material and diligent about keeping it smooth. This paired with the care required towards tension makes it kind of frustrating to learn. You also can't really go back and undo things since you're creating perforations in the material and the ribbon with each stitch, so you either have to embroider on top of your mistakes or just try and incorporate them into the design somehow. I did enjoy it a lot in the end, just don't go in expecting it to look as easy as it does in the tutorials and pictures because it's definitely not. While I stitch away, I just want to mention Skillshare, who has sponsored today's video and this project. As I'm sure you already know if you saw my previous video, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes available on pretty much every topic you can imagine. So whether it's photography, graphic design, or even ribbon embroidery that suits your fancy, they have something for you. Premium membership gives you access to unlimited classes, which means you can take as many as you want whenever you want. The classes are all taught by experts and they are conveniently broken up into sections so you can focus on what interests you most. As I said, I found the ribbon embroidery classes to be helpful for this project, even if I followed a different, less complicated pattern for this specific piece. It's not super relevant to this video, but I loved this class. It broke down different types and weaves of fabric, which was really, really interesting. I can tell what fabric is by feel, but actually hearing the differences described was really neat. I'll leave links to both of those videos in the description box down below, along with an extra special link that gives the first 500 people who use it access to a free two-month trial. And if you like it, it costs less than $10 a month to continue. I continued ribboning away until all my hoops were done. As I said, I made over 20 of these hoops and they all took at least half an hour. So I invested 10 hours into this step alone over a two day period. Here are some, but not all, of the finished hoops. I picked the two hoops that I felt suited the shape of the bodice the best, then I fussy cut away excess organza using pinking shears. Though for some of the more fiddly bits, I had to use normal scissors. Part of my reasoning for using the polyester organza as a base in the first place was that I could melt the edges with heat to prevent them from fraying. But I wasn't convinced fraying would be a problem with how little the trim would be touched once the garment was finished, so I decided to skip that step. Once my flowers were all prepared, I put my bodice on a dress form and pinned them into position. That took a lot of fiddling around, and I was standing directly in front of the camera for all of it, so let's skip to actually sewing them on. They were all stitched on by hand, and I focused my stitches around the flowers, not the edges of organza. My stitches were spaced pretty far apart and resembled basting stitches more than anything else, and that's because the appliques will be reinforced with sequins and beads later on. Lots of sequins and beads, to be exact. Also, in case I didn't explain it well before, I didn't stitch the ribbon work directly onto the garment since the tiny silk was too tightly woven. It caused the ribbon to twist quite a lot. Plus, the boning would have gotten in the way, and the larger size needle would have made the china silk pucker. Also, I'm pretty sure that ribbon embroidery was traditionally made as appliques. If you do a Google search for pieces from the 1920s and 30s, you can find some images of unused ribbon embroidered collar pieces, which are just stunning. That's like ribbon embroidery goals right there. Hashtag that and post it on Instagram. You'll be the only one. <laughs> With everything roughly secured, I pulled out a tray of sparkly things. I'm using pink, ivory, and gold sequins, along with a variety of 4mm beads, which will be used to add depth to the flowers. 
I started by stitching the sequins to the lace trim, which is mostly covered with flowers but still visible at the underarm of the bodice. I'm carrying the sequins around the flowers, using some to cover the organza base and others to bring the design further down the bodice. I'm also securing beads to the centers of the flowers to make them look more realistic. I tried to match specific beads to certain colors of ribbon, but I wasn't super consistent about doing this, which is okay because my flowers themselves weren't that consistent. I only did half of this on camera because it was very, very time consuming, so please ignore the left side. But doesn't it look wonderful? I feel like the sequins and beads add so much life to this. I liked the ribbon work on its own, but I absolutely love how it looks with the added embellishments. I was seriously giddy at this point because it was turning out so well. That actually finished off the bodice, which meant it was time for the skirt, which is made up of two 22 inch by 47 inch rectangles of china silk along with a 12 and a half inch wide strip of lace fabric. I folded this fabric over on itself several times to make it easier to cut, and I had enough of it to cut this as a single piece. I stitched the silk pieces together with a 1 inch seam allowance and left the top 10 inches open to allow the garment to be taken on and off with ease. That was ironed, then I covered the hem with lace binding, since one of China Silk's many features is fraying. And now I'm sewing the lace onto the silk with the right sides facing each other. I experimented with these materials a lot in an attempt to have them join together in a scallop design, like I did on the underdress, but I could not get it to look right, so I stitched it as a straight seam instead. Then I ironed the seam upward so it was hidden by the silk. And that is it for the base of the skirt, so I went back to my pile of embroidered bits and cut them all down into more appropriately sized appliques. And I did most of this over beige folders since it was really difficult to see the organza and see where I should be cutting over my white table. After a, I kid you not, hour of trimming these, I had a pile of appliques ready to be used. So I laid out my skirt and started placing them over the seam. I tried to keep the color pattern and shape of appliques used symmetrical on both sides of the skirt. So I switched back and forth between the left and right side and worked towards the middle. I also tried to make the color transition between the appliques smooth. Since I didn't buy a lot of a specific color of ribbon, there were a lot of different colors of flowers, which I really liked the look of, but I wanted it to look intentional and for them to all fade together nicely. So I spent a lot of time playing around with the placement. Once I was happy with the placement, I pinned everything down and moved on to a different section. Eventually, all of my appliques found homes, and it was time to repeat the process shown on the bodice, except this time it's being done across almost three yards of fabric. However, to save myself a little time, instead of basting the appliques on, I depended entirely on the hundreds of sequins to sold them down, which actually seems to have worked just fine. Also, do you like how I just put save time and hundreds of sequins in the same sentence? <laughs> I think I was a little bit more liberal with the sequence on the skirt since I wanted it to look a bit bolder than the bodice. I also did most of this off camera over a period of two days, but I did leave a 20 inch section to film the process of embellishing and that part alone took three hours. So that should give some perspective on the time that you need to invest if you want to do something similar to this. But I do think it was worth it, for me at least. I'm so thrilled with how this looks, especially with the embellishments. As I said, ribbon embroidery is something I've admired for a really long time, ever since I saw the technique used on extant garments from the 1920s and 30s. To finally feature it heavily in a design is kind of a little dream come true of mine. And I'm so glad to have a sponsor for this piece since I probably wouldn't have invested so much on ribbon without that motivation. As you can probably tell, I'm jumping around a bit here. I ended up embellishing the top edge of the piece first using orange thread. Then I added the centers of the flowers and revisited the bottom edge, this time using white thread since I was stitching over the lace. 
I also wanted to briefly explain the color palette for this project. I hadn't intended for it to be so autumn-y, though I kind of like that because I feel like this dress is a bit of an upgraded version of the fall flower fairy dress which I made so many years ago, though a lot of you will probably prefer that dress to this one. I feel like this shows off how much more time I'm putting into pieces now while having a similar overall feel to that dress. Anyway, I'd wanted it to be a bit more spring and summery and use a pink fabric as the base, but I couldn't find a silk in the weight I wanted in a pink tone anywhere, so I ended up purchasing an orange silk and a purple silk from Fabric Mart, and then I purchased as many warm, dusty toned ribbons as I could find, which I thought would work with either color palette. As it turned out, the ribbons looked a lot better over the orange base, so that's why I decided to go with. And I'm really glad that I did. Even though it's not seasonally appropriate right now, I think the warmer tones are part of what makes this piece so beautiful. I don't know if I would have gotten as much contrast and had as much visual interest if I'd used a lighter pink base like I'd originally hoped for. Sometimes limited fabric options can lead to happy accidents. And after many hours of work, my skirt was done and fully embellished to my kind of exacting standards. Well, I guess the ribbon work was done. I still had to stitch up the front edges of the skirt, which were turned inward by an inch by hand. Then I gathered the top edge of the skirt panels down, so each one was 13 inches long. And I did this with running stitches by hand. To secure the gathers and prep the skirt for being stitched onto the bodice, I sewed twill tape over top to the wrong side of the skirt. Then I pinned the bands of twill tape into the bodice so they were level with the natural waistline. I did a fitting to make sure I liked the placement and the length, then sewed them down by hand. Off camera, I finished the back edge of the bodice pieces with some lace binding. I also did a fitting and marked my desired closure placement with pins. Now I'm using a marking pen to define that line and space out the hook placement. There are four size two hooks and bars sewn into the back of this piece, and they were all stitched on with four strands of thread to make them extra durable. I also stitched up the back edge that was folded inward since I forgot to do that earlier. And that is it for this piece. Though it took much longer and was a lot more work than I'd expected, I really enjoyed making this and I think it shows in the finished garment. It's quite rare for me to feel genuinely proud and excited about my own work, but I must say I'm thrilled with how this piece turned out. The embroidery looks so much better than I'd expected, and I just want to stare at it forever since I find it so pretty. It's also one of those pieces that I put on and don't want to take off. I'm really sad that I don't have some sort of event to wear this to. And I'm also sorry that my only backdrop option for this is my closet doors. However, I do intend on photographing it somewhere more visually pleasing soon, since this dress definitely deserves better. I hope you guys like it even half as much as I do, and that you enjoyed this video. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this, and thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it, and we'll talk to all of you very soon. I think it kind of looks like a dress that you would wear before you get captured and taken to the underworld. And as someone who believes in having a dress for every occasion, I think this is a valid addition to my wardrobe. <laughs> Ways to justify making a new dress, number 387. <laughs>